Okay, good to see all of you here. Uh, let me. And let's see, if you have your microphone on, turn it off, mute it, please. Uh, you don't want to hear me uh, listening to you and telling you, I, you have a great, you have a great dog there. So mute that puppy and we'll go there. Okay, now uh, I want to talk about, I just sent everybody an email and I want to make sure also that you uh, understand that it's posted over here, and that's the late policy, late late policy, late assignments. Okay. Now I have a po I have been posted. Usually it's in this section, the course orientation. You'll find, or you'll find it in the files. And uh, then I send an email out. And the reason I'm doing it is because we're coming up to week seven, and then of course there's week eight, and you need to know where you are. Now, I have, and this is kind of a speech I'm going to do for everybody, so don't feel like in this particular class I'm singled you out. That's, that's not the case at all. It's important for you to understand that at this point, any late work, it's, if it's your first time, it's half credit. From there on out, it's a zero. I don't take late work after uh, uh, week 10. And I always end up with some people, uh, why, I don't know, with half a dozen or so assignments they've not turned in. That's their problem, not mine. And uh, so I, I am gonna give everybody a little spiel all about that. All right, that being said, and like I said, every every group, every set class I have has gotten this email and, and then I, and they'll hear my little speech. Let's dispense with that and take a look at where we are. Okay, and we're down here at week six. Now, you'll notice that I have nothing here for you except uh, some links and for some resources. And the reason is, is because we're at that point now where we're working ahead on these lunches database cases. And I'm going to work us through it fast enough that we'll come to a point where you'll have time to be working on uh, some major projects in the course. And then to, and then, and also if you wish to work on the finals. So we're, we're coming to that point where we'll, we'll have that, that piece done. Now, again, I'm not going to be a quiz over any of this stuff, but I do think it would be smart for you to go out there and take a look at it and see there's some information about the information builders. Um, the warehousing talks about that. There's, and maybe if you heard the, there's a, an SQL Academy, Scorn Coding Free, uh, I have also instructions there on how to access SAS Visual Analytics. That's uh, something that you'll be using. And here's a little blurb on um, on the data revolution and uh, baseball in terms of looking at metrics for fielding. Let me pop open here for a second. I'm glad to see Ashley, Josh, Matt, Madeline, uh, Matthew, Rhett, Sarah, G11, okay, Heath. And Reagan, and let's see if we got more. No, I think that does it. Okay, great. I'm sure we'll have some other people join us as well. Uh, now, I want I want to go over for a moment. And I'm going to open up a new tab. I'm going to go to the New York Times because there's a really really excellent uh, article over there that they put together, and it deals with. Um, Lo the, the location of, of your, where you live, okay, location, and how that may impact the opportunity for you to advance economically. And I want to find that because I had it uh, over here. Here it is. This is, now I want to show you, as you've heard me talk about, you know, databases are the foundation. D data warehouses are the foundation of dashboards. Now, this is kind of like a little storyboard thing where they got a moving picture of this neighborhood and they're providing you some information about uh, certain neighborhoods within geographic codes, okay? And the children who grow up there in, in poverty, any of you know, those who are in poverty, had the, the, uh, the likelihood that they're going to get out of it. And, and basically, is there an opportunity, is there, a, is there for those folks a level of opportunity economically that's different 
from other people. And these researchers have done quite a bit of work and they have this fantastic map. And I'm gonna scroll down here. Now, this is gonna show you, and you can put in the, uh, you can put in a zip code uh, and the, in, in the location. So you can see, now I'll give you an example. If you look over here, you're gonna see this on, uh, let's, let me, let's see. This is gonna be Broadway, there's Santa Fe. I'll show you for example, uh, on one side of Santa Fe in that neighborhood, okay, um, the family's expected to earn about $30,000 a year. That's close to the median income for Oklahoma. As you slide across here, you see a big difference. And what the research has said is it's the environment in which a child grows up in about a half a mile radius, okay, that determines if, if, they, if they grow up in poverty, that they'll escape it. Uh, if they are in the middle class, they'll stay. So there's, there's some good data here for you to look at, but I want you to see this because this uses a database. A lot of this is collected by the, uh, probably from, from the researchers who did the study, probably government data, and they've superimposed it on a map. And then of course, up here, uh, where they say, okay, um, put in a zip code, right? They're basically saying, okay, We'll pop down here. This is like a now, kind of like a form, and you could put in your zip code. I'm gonna put in 74804 just to see okay, how that looks. Of course, that's Shawnee, Oklahoma. And you can see the, uh, the different areas there in Shawnee. And this also will let you break this down by uh, ethnicity. Okay, so got some interesting data. And again, this is really nothing more than an application of a database. Okay, so I wanted to let you see that. Now, let's go back here to the class. And as I said, we're over here in module six and I have some resources for you. Now we have been working ahead, all right, and you should have at this point uploaded, I have these here for you to upload, they're due on the 11th, seven, eight, okay, lunch database seven, lunch is database eight, and lunch is database nine. Now, we covered uh, over in chapter seven, we did a tremendous amount of discussion about the data, about format, pardon me, formats, sequences, and indexes. And we went through all this and, uh, you know, we I talked about you know, the, the need for us to make sure, okay, that we have formatting properly. And as you could see in that chapter, there's probably, there's a ta large table that addresses all of the formatting issues that we have with data. So one of the things I've said over the years is, if you have data, that will be difficult to format in, 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 in your database so I can access, export it over into Excel or into a, an analytic or a computational machine. Now, that being said, most of the proprietary products that are out there now already take that into account and have the data formatted for you properly. So that's one of the advantages you have, but you need to be aware of it. Now, Chapter eight, and I've got the I've got the workshop for it that you need to up, uh, that you can upload. Chapter eight deals with referential integrity, okay, and the whole issue, and that's over on page. If you look on page two eighty two, you'll see that table of contents, and then two eighty three, the, the 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 chapter eight begins, and they talk about the different constraints. And, and, and these constraints in, in Excel, pardon me, in Access, you can, add, you can build constraints either by writing code or on more, it's much more easy actually to go into the graphic user interface, i.e. the design view, okay? And as you develop fields, put the kind of constraint in that you want, or if you, or, or, or on the other hand, uh, you can go ahead and, and then just write the, or you could write the code to put that into the table. Now, the top of page 23, the authors 
and you should have your textbook out using it. The authors talk about refer referential integrity and making sure, and they say a constraint keeps the data consistent. What they mean by consistent is, first of all, that every record is unique. This is what we call, uh, the nor there are five steps to, to normalize a database, and the first is to make sure that every record is unique. Now, you may have the same person buy several books, okay? Or you could turn it around and say several books have been bought by a person. But every one of those transactions involving that person should have something that identifies it as a unique transaction. If not, uh, you, you've got chaos. And if not, you don't have the capacity to really dig down and find uh, and, and get the, the type of data that you're after. And just like we looked at that detailed map, that, that's really a summary. And they use some conditional formatting there to show the most prevalent uh, 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 income level. And i just quickly take you back here for just a second. I'll show you. Because this is all the elements of a database. Take a look. And of course, you could do a search. Okay, so they have a little form here. And then you'll see at the bottom, these definitions of income. In other words, a legend uh, for, for what that is. And it was, I just thought it was incredibly, uh, they've been working on this thing for a long, long, long time, and it helps them understand about economic opportunity and how neighborhoods can shape that. Well, you can read the article, and I would encourage you that you do. But uh, we're gonna take a look here for just a minute at Lunch's D Database 8, and I have that here for you. I've uploaded it and you should be able to see it. Well, let me make it visible. I'm sorry, I've been talking about it and it's not visible. And I bet if you do a refresh on your, uh, on your, on your machine, you're gonna see uh, Lunch's database, you'll, you'll see it updated, okay? Now, um, what I'm going to do is let's take this, let's take this and download it. Okay. And then we'll go in and we'll kind of reverse engineer it this time. Now, if you'd like to, you can see the code that's there in the textbook and you could work through those problems. And we're gonna look at what was some that we've got over here already, okay? And so I'm going to open that up, go back over here. I'm gonna put this in a folder and throw it on my desktop, okay? And here it is, lunch is DB8. Now I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna go ahead and enable the, enable the content. And so you say, is this all I have to do? Yes. But we're going to talk about this because we can run through some of the code. Now, you'll notice as you go through, if you just click on the queries, you'll see the queries that I've done. 810, number 1, 810, number 2, 813. And we'll scroll down here some more and see if there's anything from uh, anything else from Chapter 8. I don't believe there is. Oh, yeah, there's an update query, Step 1. There's another 821, 822. So we'll pop pop into the each of those. Now I'm just going to walk you through the text this chapter real quickly, and then we'll take a look at nine uh, because I want to get that out of the way. Chapter eight again covers data integrity, and they start with uh, creating constraints. Okay, and they give you the uh, some. The constraints are a way for us to make every record unique, okay? And they say, okay, you're, you'll have to have like a primary, you'll have to have a primary key. We've talked about that some. Uh, we have to have a certain number of characters, et cetera. So they work you through, and over on page 285, the authors talk about unique constraints. 
And then they show you an example over there in 286 in the access GUI method. That's page 286. Now look, if the, the database administrator for wherever you work probably will have a commercial product that lets them do this. As I've said before, access is kind of the, the mother of all databases that are, that are used at a commercial or sub-commercial uh, 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 level. Now, over on page 287, you're gonna see a constraint which says the employee ID must be a number, okay? And it's required down in the field properties and it's indexed, duplicates are okay because you're gonna have that same employee entered several times, but the employee number itself is unique. Let's go over here for a moment and take a look. Oh, over on page 288. Now we're at the point now where you should be able to take a look at some code and see it. Let's look at I'm right. I'm, I'm right in the middle of um, page 288 on the in the textbook, and here I'm going to use an alter table. Okay, uh, and we alter the table and we name the table. Then the second line, we add a constraint. And that PK means, of course, the primary code, uh, a primary key for those employees. And then the primary key is identified as the employee ID. Okay? And that's, and, and that's what, we're, what, what we would run. And that's going to be, I think, 8.5. Again, I had mentioned the code for Chapter 8. So I'm going to open up the um, Patrick materials real quickly. And uh, there's the code for the specific chapters. And we'll look at chapter nine, okay? You can see that we've got, the, pardon me, chapter eight, excuse me. And there's the very first one. And what we'll do is we're gonna alter the table we name the table and then we add, we tell, we're gonna add a constraint, which is a primary key, and we identify the field or the dimension or the column that will be the employee ID, okay? Then there's a test here where you, and, and this is supposed to give you a, 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 um, an error message. Now, before I go too far, again, I can't emphasize enough having your book with you as we go through this so you can see the before and after of the tables, you can see the code, et cetera, and see some of this in context. They have a very good, they have an excellent figure there uh, over on page 290 on the concept of referential integrity, and they show you the lookup table. And you remember back in 1123, we made lookup tables, and you use lookup tables to make them. As, an, as a convenience, okay? But it's also to ensure that you limit the choice or choices of response. And that way you have referential integrity. You'll see here, for example, they have a lookup table. And it's also called, as I mentioned there, a reference table or a parent table. And then the table where you embed that, that uh, link it to, that's the child. And you'll see that they have uh, a primary key and that table, the data tables or the child, that's what you, what you poured into and you get the foreign key. Those are primary keys from another, from a, a, another uh, table. And I think, I think you get that and see that, okay? And you can notice that. Then over on 8.8, when they've got this, here they're gonna alter a table again and uh, they're showing us the before and the after, well, pardon me, the lookup table, okay, and then the data table. And the lookup table is page 292 is the state code, the state name capital, okay? And then on the client's table, you can add that state in there, okay? And that's what they're going to have you do, and, and it, it references, they're in the middle of page 292. Well, let's look at this. Here's the, here, here it is. Right here, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to alter the table. I indicate what table I'm altering, okay? Then I'm going to add a constraint. And this time, I'm using an FK, which is a foreign key. 
in other words, it, this, this column list, pardon me, column or ID or attribute or field is a primary key in another table. So we call it a foreign key. This is important that we use it and understand it because this is how we start to link tables up and, and maintain referential integrity, okay? And then they're gonna use the foreign key, it would be the state code, and then, it, and then we say it references the following table, okay? So that, that's basically what's going on. Then over on page 293, they show you, uh, they're in the middle, page 293, uh, and a, um, uh, an insert statement. And he tells you to expect some inserts. And here's on 810, okay? And look, when you do an insert, okay, typically you're better off, as opposed to running the, uh, a, 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 the code, as I've said before, use a form that controls all of this. And here what we're saying is we're gonna insert into this uh, 0810 table three values, um, a 700, I'm not sure what that is, and then the name Gail Hauser and the state is Oregon. And they, okay, the 700 is the client ID. And you'll see that Oracle and Access code there on page uh, 294 at the bottom, the beginning table, and then the ending table where they've added that in Gail Hauser, okay? And so you can see how we try to, to, to utilize foreign keys and primary keys to add constraints. And it's typically gonna be done within the confines of a primary key or a foreign key. Sometimes you'll use some other, uh, what we call slowly changing dimensions, like a state code, all right? Now, we got this access open, and let's look over here for just a second, and we'll, we'll go down here. Now this is 810 number one, all right? And let's go to the design view and see what is going on. Now, if you take a look up at the top of the toolbar, you see me, you'll notice that the append is hot, it's turned dark. And we, what it's saying is, you're about to run an append query, okay? And that's the same as 8, 8 10, number three, 8, 10, number uh, 8, 13, number one. He has you walk through a series of these, inserting some stuff or updating it, et cetera, and adding the values in. And he has you do an insert, there at the bottom, 292, they have you do an update, then a delete. And I think, you now page 293 is where he has the three inserts, okay? And those would be 8, 13, 1, 2, and 3. And again, uh, he's inserting values in, then the second query, he's doing an update, okay? And the third, he's deleting. So it's just on what you want to do or not do. And you can see, man, I'm not even going to take the time to run the, I know the queries work, and that first one would be 813 number one. Uh, and I've got it here for you, and I'll show you the design view on it. Okay. Once it says I'm going to insert into the 0813 states table some values. Now, you always want to make sure that you put in, uh, it's my belief, it works best if you put in values for every single field in the table in which you're inserting the data. You can see now why I harp so much about using forms to maintain the refer referential integrity. Um, then they talk about uh, you know, setting up uh, uh, relationships between tables, or at bottom page 299, and I'm gonna click on database tools, and then I'm gonna look at relationships, and there you'll see them. Okay, and we've looked at these enough to see to understand what we're saying. 
Here's the primary key. And we have a primary key for each of these tables. Okay. And notice how the data flow. We've got a departmental code and a department name. And over here, we have a department code in this employees table. And I'm going to click right on that line, and you'll see it will say edit relationship. Okay. And notice that they have the edit relations dialog box. I think, yeah, the author shows you one over on page 301, and we've worked with these dialog boxes before. It's, it's just saying, okay, what table or query are you using, uh, i.e. the parent? What's the related one, i.e. the child and uh, the field? And then you want to enforce referential integrity. Do you want to, when you update a related field, do you want them all updated? And those are the choices that the authors have made as far as that relationship. Now, you can also say what type of join is it. And this is what we would call an intersection, an inner join. That is only, we're only going to include the rows, i.e. records, where the two of them are equal. The second and third choices have to deal with what we call a left-handed jo uh, join or a right-handed join. And you'll notice in the second one, I'm getting records uh, from one, I'm getting all the records from the department's table and then getting only those records from the employee's table where they match. And we'll talk about this in some, some, in some uh, later cases where we're using uh, right and left hand joins. And then here's the third. And again, I'm, now this time I'm getting everything from the employee's table and then only those that match from departments. And there are some different business cases, strategies, situations that you're after when you want a whole set of records, but you only want those, and then you want to intersect that, do an inner join with another set of records and only on the basis of where they match. Okay. So you're not, you're, 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 you have the whole data, you have the whole table that's of importance to you, and then you, use that join and, and inner join to get the records from another table where everything matches up. And that could be probably going to be something like I, some type of ID. It's usually going to be some type of an ID on a person or on maybe a product or region, whatever. And, and that, and that's, that's, that's basically when we were in 1103, you saw this and uh, now we're not going to change it, but that's just to let us, get a sense of how that works, okay? Now, I'm whipping on through chapter eight fairly fast, and if you go over to page 300, you're gonna see 815, and they talk about setting up the, re the, re the referential integrity in an access GUI, okay? And so they go over here and you show the table, okay? And then you can add and, and you can edit, you can put the two tables out there, and then you can edit the relationship and you can join them. And you'll see over page 29302 where you join tables. We've done this type of thing before. It's not a big deal, but I'll go ahead and look at the database tools, we'll look at relationships. And I'm going to join the tables if I can. All right. Now I have this department code, and this is the parent, this is the child, okay? And in terms of employees table, I can have all the departments coded. So that's why I have a one to many relationship there. Now, if there's something else where that, that will work, I can link them up, I'm gonna to try to do that. Let's take this and pull this down a little bit more. Now I'll try to do that here. I'm, I need this a little bit. Now, on the employees, see, if I don't have, now, here again is department code, 
And this time I have the department code to the employee. To the, well, I have this to the employees here. And then over here, I'm using it as a foreign key. Okay. In each case, department code is a primary key. So in effect, it's, it, it's, a, it's a foreign key over here in this table. And I don't know why the authors chose not to identify it as such, but now they show you the opposite flow where many departments, okay, are linked back to the department code, the, the drop down menu that we've talked about before. And they walk you through some of this, the information about updates, deletes, and that's where the cascade, uh, and I'll just show what we're talking, what they're talking about. I'll click right here on the line, I'll click edit relationship, and you'll see in the dialog box, I enforce a referen referential integrity, I cascade updates. What this says is when I update a record, anywhere else that record is housed in the database, it gets updated. You want to be careful about this one. <laughs> this one can be deadly. The casual uh, the cascade delete because you could take all the records out <laughs> of a data table database or a warehouse and you need them and you're in trouble. Okay, so there's the you could the the code for these and the GUI is is pretty simple. If you look over at page 308, I'm going to close this off. Okay, we'll close that. No, and I'm going to go over here to oh, uh, to task 818, okay? Let's see if we had run it in here. Oh, so we go down. If not, we can see the code and still make sense of it. We did 18, may not have. We didn't do a, we didn't do 818, but let's, uh, let's just go ahead and do it. And again, I'm going to grab the uh, chapter eight files real quickly. And I should have that, the chapter eight files out here somewhere. All righty. Let's open it up. And the access code, we'll open it. And there's number eight. Now. Oh, we can down here to 818. I probably just wasted some time, but why well, don't we move pretty fast though? Now, here on, uh, they give us on, on, um, on 818, num task number one, they want us to set up referential integrity. Okay. And he, but he doesn't give you any code. All right. Now, he doesn't give you any code because he's assuming that you're using the dialog box, i.e. the GUI method that he shows you there at the top of page 307. Okay, then on, then the second task is he's going to delete uh, any, anywhere, he's going to delete any records from California. And he shows you that um, client's table, and the states table, the, the beginning table, parent and child. And then he runs task two and he ends up with this ending table. So it's just a process where you're adding or deleting those records. And that's about all that's going on. I mean, it's basically um, you're going to delete uh, from this table. This is the first line of the code where here's the condition the state code equals california then here uh, we're going to see those tables and those we're going to select with an asterisk so we'll see everything 
Then we're going to update the table. And anywhere where, where the state code was California, we're now going to call that ZZ. Okay? So we're, we're changing the state code in the state's table. And that's all that we're doing. Then here we're altering the table itself. We're not updating a field or a column. We're changing the we're changing the table by altering by adding a a, a a constraint. And that's really all that that's going on there in chapter eight. It's just wash you through the GUI, some more of these methods, but making sure that you have referential integrity now. Over on 311, the authors talk about the, the two meanings of a primary key, okay? And uh, they explain that, and, and then after thoroughly confusing you, <laughs> which they, which they can easy, easily do, uh, they give you some nice examples of the variations of that and some notes in terms of uniqueness of records. And then they talk about using two or more columns for the primary key. And you can do that. You can use two different columns to create a completely, to, to complete, to create a unique ID. For example, it might be your employee number plus your social security number. And that's, that, those are both unique and, and you might have them set up as the primary keys. Now, why would you do that? Well, because once you've done that, you can then link to, it to twice as many tables as you could before. And it also adds an additional level of, of, of referential integrity that helps, you, that helps you through that. And you wanna talk about that, you wanna take a look at that, that, uh, that, that feature, okay? Um, and, and, and just kind of read it and absorb it. It's, it's a little confusing, but it's basically the ability to add in some, an additional primary key to even, even further refine the referential integrity, okay? And that might, for example, let's say you have a, people who clock in, okay? And you have a, a database that, that can, follows the, those who, who log in. Well, you're you're going to be looking at the employee ID. You may have uh, maybe uh, some other uh, unique identifier, like they're a member of a certain team, a member of a certain department, whatever. As you can see, why this just makes it more and more specific in terms of what's uh, uh, of that record. It makes it even more unique, and that's how you build on that referential integrity. And remember, you know, as, we, as I showed you, when we're linking these tables, okay, that's when we really start to get some value from a, where, from a database of any type or a data warehouse. And that's pretty much it as far as Chapter 8 goes. Now, let me say once again, and I'll close this off and go back up. Uh, you can download this and then upload it for workshop credit, right? If you want to, you could say, well, it's not due till the 11th. I think I'll just open up Patrick chapter eight and experiment a little bit. I'm fine with that too, okay? I, I don't care. Uh, I kind of plucked those that I thought were worth using and running because I wanted just to show you through the text. And again, it's quicker for me, uh, to, like on page 315, Let's take that as an example. This is 820, this is 822. The very first line tells us what we're gonna do is alter a table. The second line says I'm gonna add a constraint, that'll be a, a, a foreign key, and then identify what that foreign key is, and then what it references. Pretty simple code. And he's got some notations there for you. And you see the lookup table. Okay. And the data table are essentially the same. He said, oh, okay. And again, he walks you through all of this 
coding and all these things. Look, most uh, most of the, of the products that are out there today have this, have you writing less and less code as a database administrator and, and using the graphic user interface more and more. And the database management course, for example, that all the, the uh, computer science students take, is more about programming the database in taking a database and putting it into uh, some type of e-commerce platform or some other type of platform, okay, using a particular uh, computing language. And, it's, and, and that's, that's far beyond this course, okay? It's really for people to do that. For those of us who make our living making decisions, it's important for us to understand how, if we have those tables designed effectively, and how if we maintain, if they're maintaining the referential integrity, it gives us far more bang for the buck. We get even more refined, uh, pardon me, even more refined uh, types of results. And so that's that's basically what's going on there. And and um, you know that that's about it. Now. In chapter nine, and that starts over on page 321, we take a kind of a departure. Well, really not. Notice that we've been working on tables, pulling data from them, um, referential and maintaining referential integrity, using constraints, primary keys. I think we've even created, so we've created some tables. And so we've been oriented to that, oriented to that, excuse me, and oriented to uh, the data dictionaries. So we've got, so we've come to the point now where we have the table developed. Now we want to use it. And this is extract data from it. And now this is when we start to get in chapter nine into, into starting with the, with the row functions, okay? And what this really says, we're working with, uh, we're working with records. Now the authors use the term function, okay? And if you look over at page 324, they'll tell you what a row function is, okay? And they show you the example of a beginning table with a record, and then you get a new value created by some, uh, by a row function from one of the values in, in one or more columns in a single row. Now, if you want to see the, the, in reality, page 323, that beginning table, notice how you've got uh, these squares, okay? And there's uh, one, two, three, four. There's a set of, of um, 12 of them. And notice that we use a row function and we get a result table that has uh, three records, kind of has four records, using three fields or three columns. And so we're, 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 we're doing some kind of calculation, comparison, some type of, um, of, of taking row a row value or values, typically two values, and, and getting a new result. Now, Let's go ahead and down uh, chapter nine. Here's the, the upload nine here. So we'll go ahead and down, download it. Go back here for a second. I want the LD9. My brain's not working this week at all. My apologies. Okay. We are a little bit here. Here's the lunches uh, database nine. I'm sorry. Now again, in order in order to avoid uh, having you march through this, I try to cover the highlights, believing that if you get the highlights, you probably understand the other stuff you'll be seeing as you work through the text or you're working with it. So here's lunch's database nine, okay? And we're gonna be using some row functions and I'm gonna open this up. Okay, and I'll enable the content. And I'm gonna come into queries. 
and scroll down and start to look for queries from chapter nine. And we'll see them. Here, for example, is one from 910. Okay, let's just put it in design view and take a look at it. And uh, 910, eight, 910 is over on, I'll tell you real quickly. Well, I've got some stuff I want to show you first here before we do that. Um, here, what we're going to do is we're going to select the employee ID, their first name, we, and we have an ampersand, which says, and a blank space, last name as full name from the employees. Now, we're running a row function, okay? And we're using that ampersand, okay, to pull together the blank space between the two fields that we're after there. Now, over in the text textbook, okay, this is at the bottom of, of uh, page 344, okay, we're using concatenation. We're combining two things, and in this case, we're, combi we're combining the first name and the last name, the first name uh, and the last name with a space between them, and we're renaming the field. So we're using some con concatenation. Now, if you look, you'll see over starting at page 340, the text functions, tons and tons and tons of them of dealing with text and organizing text in a way that, 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 that makes sense to us. All right, and he'll show us access, um, and then the oracle, and then the description, and an example. If you look at page 342, you'll see that they have the up, you want, if you want everything uppercase, all right, then in oracle, uh, you're gonna use upper, uh, in, uh, in, in access, you'd use ucase, or a string conversion, comma one, meaning you're gonna convert the string to upper level case, and they show you those examples. So this way you can get the kind of data in the report that you wanna get, and again, it's just a row function. These make some sense in terms of, of, of text, of pulling text together. Let's look at 912, okay? and put that into the design view. Now 912 is gonna be over on page 349, all right? And they show you the beginning table and the, and the ending table, and here's what's going on. They're going to, to select employee ID, okay? The first name, the last name. Then they're going to put in, notice the single quotes, an area code with a prefix, and a dash, okay? Then you see the appersand, phone number as phone number two from the employees. And, the, and, and so you're combining, you're, you're, you're uh, formatting those phone numbers to make them have that, the, the format that you want. And you'll see at the top here, if you look at the beginning table of page 349, okay? You're gonna see the, the, the phone number and then the result table at the bottom has the area code plus the suffix. Area code plus the prefix and then the suffix means the first three letters, uh, first three numbers, and then the last three. And that's, that's what you're doing at the row function where you're concatenating and pulling things together. And it also talks about date functions that you can use in rows. And it's got those tables tons of them, and on 914, he, he, he shows his page, this is over on page 355, okay? On 914, he shows us using uh, the uh, integer function, okay, or a rounding function that, that access has as a row function. And if you wanna see some more information about that integer, the INT, you go back over to page 350, and uh, you'll, you'll see some information. I think it's at page 350, page 335, excuse me. 
335. But let's look at this for just a moment. This would be 914, okay? And we're working with text, okay? And let me do this. I'm gonna take this and size it up so we can see it a lot better. Let's see? Open up pad. Let's see if I've got a word pad or word doc out there that I could mess with. This is this. Now I'll make these larger. Now, let me stop here for just a minute. Now you can see we're going to select the first name, the last name, and the higher date. Okay, and then we, we're using that integer, okay, and, uh, and, and this rounds it, to, rounds it to an integer format. And you see the beginning table, all right, and you see the higher dates, and then go to page 356 and see the ending table, okay. And you can see how we have, we've pulled the higher date and we divided it by 30 to get the number of months with the company. Now here's what happened. When we use the integer, we convert this to an integer, we converted it to a number. And then we divide that by 30. And we set as number as months with the company. That's what we were doing. So we had string text that we had text there or date date data, which are essentially numbers. So we turn them into integers, okay? And so they would they would they would round up, and we we applied that function right here, and then we used the alias an alias to name this field as months of the company, and we pull it from employees. And you can see 355 and 356, the beginning and the end. Now, I'm going to stop for just a second. Let me pop back up here and see if anybody's got some questions that I can help you with. Anybody? I'm glad to see so many of us here. This is good. Oh, I, oops, looked, got me, got me in chat. Okay, let me see what we got. Uh, okay, yeah, I've got someone telling me that nine's not published. Okay, that, that makes sense that I would uh, sit here and rattle on about it. Let's go over here and let me go back and see if I published it. And if I didn't, yeah, lunch is that. Yeah, here it is. It's published. Oh, oh no, this isn't. Pardon me. You're right. I'm sorry. Okay, so refresh and you'll and you'll have those you'll have those queries there. Okay, so it's published, so you can upload it, but you were able to see what I was doing in there anyway, so it, yeah, 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 no, harm, no harm, no foul. Okay, now, again, in row functions, we can do mathematical operations, uh, and that's what we did, for example, over on page 355, where we took that date, Okay, and said, we're gonna do an integer function. We're gonna treat the date as a number. We're gonna divide it by 30, all right? And you'll see the integer function, INT, and then the double quotes, because we wanna make sure that the quote marks match up, okay? And we have two headed to the right, two headed to the left, so we're good there. And we're gonna divide that date, that number for that date by 30, and so that we don't get like 30.6 months or 30.8 months, use integer because it rounds it up. And they're on page 356. Voila, we've got the number of months they've been with the company. Okay. And some other functions that work with time data. And oh, 915. Let's see if I if I we'd mess with that. A little bit here. Yep. 
Who's database nine? And oh, I did. I did nine fifteen. This is uh, showing the times. I'll open this up. Put it in design view. And I'm going to write, and this shows us the times. And it shows us the lunch date. And the date was entered. Okay. And that shows us the, and the uh, we see the beginning and the ending tables there on page 358. So we work with row functions. There are chapter 10 moves us on into other row functions, uh, including some things like changing nulls, um, changing data, data types, picking one value, um, picking one value, which is not available over there in, um, and access okay and again now I did nine two nine three here's nine four we'll look at this just a second there's a menu item a fresh salad and then the new price ah the new price so let's take a peek down at the SQL and we'll see I'm gonna copy that and then we'll throw it up here And here we are. Get this up a little bit. We're going to select a menu product, menu item and the description, those two fields, and then price. And notice the plus. Okay, that's a row function. We can add across a row as or we can add to an to a column or a field if you will. So we're going to take price plus price increase as the new price from the foods table. And we're going to put some conditions on this. Where the price plus the price increase is greater than two bucks. And then we're going to order it by price plus the price increase. And you can see that Now it's going to be nine four. It's going to be back here by the chatter, but it's one to take a, a good look at because it's a, a nice row function. Page three thirty, and you see the beginning table and the ending table. And what we did is we showed in the beginning table we showed the price and the price increase, and then in the result table where we used that uh, we used the addition sign which is says add these two together we got the new price for the items okay same kind of thing with nine five nine three uh, here's here's nine five this is the second step he walks you through several of these and let me see if there's one I want to mess with. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Now I want to see what we did. I think it was. I think we did the mod, mod on the mode on this one. Yeah, we did the mod. And here it is. We'll just select it. And we use the mod function. Okay. And the mod function is exactly what you would expect it to be. It's a mathematical function. And we're going to select, uh, and was, let's run this. And there we are. Okay. Now we've got in. 
right? And we have this expression, and let's go down to the GUI. Oh, it's, oh it's, it's, we're gonna have to go down to the, um, down to the code. All right, this is nine four oh one. Yeah. Where was my mod function here? I'm sorry. Thanks. Okay. Can anybody tell me what the mod function is? Any takers? It's the MOD, it's the mod function. It's a numeric function. We can do an access. Anybody know what that is, what the mod function is? Anybody? It may be, well, it may be worth your time to know what it is. It's an old, old, old favorite. And if you take a look over at page 3, 20, 30, 35, you're going to see it. Those tables are excellent for you in terms of your, some of the projects you're doing. You may have to use them. But if you look there, you're going to see the mod function, which is the remainder after division. Okay. So an axis, an axis that we take, uh, uh, you know, as they show us an example, 10 mod 3, we're going to divide it by 3, and then we'll show the remainder. Okay. And there's some reason I would use this. I want to look back again at the... Back at that table. And let's just run it. And the authors, the authors walk us through it. And I'm, you know, I'm sometimes they'll use these and I go, okay, why would I use that? So this is something to think about. But somebody somewhere, um, well, okay. Page 337 gives you a bit of an insight. If you want to look at a function, um, where X goes from minus 10 to plus 10. Why? I guess you'd want to do that. I don't know. Uh, there's probably a practical reason, and somebody could tell me about it. That would be fun. All right. As you probably can tell, I'm just kind of searching through, looking for the, the stuff that I think is, is useful for you. There's 9.7. All right, and let's put that, it shows up as an expression, and let's go down to the uh, SQL view on this. And it says select three times four from dual. Dual is a table, a dimension table that has numbers in it. And we're just gonna simply take the two numbers and multiply them, and there's our view, we get 12. That's all that's going on. So you can see that. And then they have a variation of, of 9.7. We'll look at it. Okay. And we still get the 12. Now I want you to notice, and let's go in 9.7 in that variation. Let's go down to the design view. Well, we don't have a design view. We just have the code. And what we've done is we said, okay, I'm going to select three times four as expression one. So we've used a column alias there to get that accomplished. It's just a variation on it. That's all it is. But notice that we use the dual table. Now, we've been messing around with these queries, so let's go back up to the tables and let's find dual and open it up. And there's a dummy column. Okay? And go into the uh, design. And it's a dummy column, has a field size of 50. And we'll go up to the, to the uh, data set view, and there it is. It's just a dummy column, and that will give me some counts, or, or I can add, I can do, use it to do some computation. That's really all it's about there. 
Um, there, these become fairly specialized, but the truth is, when you work when you work with some of these. Um, you're just going to have to, you, you, you may hit those spots. When you go to work, a lot of this will, 95, 99% this will be done for you, okay? You may have to take and export some data over into Excel, particularly if it's numeric data and you want to do some different things. With it. But for all intents and purposes, the, uh, the row functions are pretty extensive. They let you separate things. For example, over on page 346, okay? Um, they show you how to separate first and last names, and they show that over there on page 347. All right. And you do a, you do a first step, and what you're going to do is create a position space, and you're from that full name thing. And then the second uh, step is you're going to create a view, and you're going to, you're going to use the mid function if I now many times you have to you have to utilize these uh, to to get at data that maybe were not inputted correctly or formatted correctly or you want reformatted and and that uh, 911 step one and two is is of that ilk where you're separating first and last names, you're formatting phone numbers, stuff um, that, you know, it's just, it, this is really, these these things, the, if you wanna see the how they look differently, they, they can be reformatted. And so if, you, if, you're, if, you're in, if you're in a company and you're getting reports and you don't like the, the, the format of the data, ask first, is it possible for us to alter this or just to run this a little bit different? So I get like, you know, um, I get a particular a date that's date and time stamped, or I get uh, a currency uh, as opposed to just raw numbers, that type of thing. And show me price increases. All of these different are kind of very specialized uh, steps that we do over in chapter nine. And it's a way for the, the, for the authors to kind of let us put our toe in the water, all right, if you will, and uh, get ready to work over in chapter 10. Now, I'm going to close this off here for a sec. Okay. Database. And uh, no. Now, so you have the you have the files that you can upload for eight, nine, and ten, and it won't hurt you uh, with these maybe uh, to go back and 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 do a little bit of looking at them. Maybe get the transcript that will be over there. They'll be produced by the video, or or should be produced by the will be produced by the video of this, and your text and kind of figure out it, it's there. There's so many of them. And it's really more an issue of troubleshooting. There's not a lot of standardized kinds of situations. Uh, date and time is probably the one that's going to be used the most. Now, over in Chapter 10, we're going to start to see some specialized, uh, some specialized row functions. And these will be some that you probably are going to use more often. However, if you get to those, especially those that are numeric in, in, in nature, um, you probably, they will already probably, they will probably be already formatted for you. If they're not, you can always take the output, dump it into Excel and put it in a format that you want if it's important to do. Uh, asking them to take it all and put it into a certain format, your, your vendor or your data admin, may or may not make you the, one of their favorite people, 
because it's rudimentary, rudimentary stuff and you can probably do it in Excel a lot better, like take a set of numbers and change them to currency or put them into accounting format or anything like that. Otherwise for these guys, they've got to sit down and write some code and, and throw, it into the, throw it into the magic box and, uh, and get it all done. Well, we started a little bit early today, and uh, I do appreciate all of you who've stayed, good attendance. And so you've got eight, nine uh, lunches, uh, eight and nine there that you can upload, seven, eight, and nine. And so those are all due the 11th of October, but there's no reason not to have them uploaded because you've got, you already have the uploads there. And you have this video to kind of see how we supplement. And as you'll note, I've Notice I've not just marched through the chapter. I've tried to hit what I thought were some of the highlights. Okay. There's a lot of these that you could just do one step, one step, one step, one step until you get to the final point uh, of, of the data looking exactly like you want them to be using a row function. And then we're going to see some more specialized function. We work on 10 and we'll do that on Thursday. Thank you very much for being here. And, um, I will see all of you on Thursday. Anybody have a question before I go? Okay.